In sports this evening, a titanic struggle, if ever there was one, at least on paper and before the game. Tonight, the Miami Dolphins will try to unplug the refrigerator and shut down Walter Payton and thus rob the Chicago Bears of their chance for an undefeated season. How about them, New York Giants? The wild card playoff team, almost two touchdown underdogs going in, managed to ruin the Patriots' perfect season. And so a big win for the Falcons. Carolina losing for the first time this season. Had they won this game, win next week, and then go into the playoffs with the pressure of being undefeated uh, and trying to tie the Miami Dolphins record. I know you wonder what it's like to lace up the shoes of a player stepping on the field without a thing to lose. The bus is posing up the view on ESPN, asking me that stupid question. Think they'll do it again? Once again, I'm holding school about the thought of defeat. I got no losses on my table, so you can't take my seat. My perfect history would tell you that the record's complete. Stand up, you busters playing if you tasted defeat. Every year they try to bust out trying to capture the crown. I've been trying to tell you busters, you can't play in our town. And the answer to your question is still the same. You want to go undefeated, you got to win every game. I know you wonder. There is no almost undefeated. You either win them all or you get beat. The only thing important was winning the Super Bowl and when we ran the table in the regular season, no one talked anything about being undefeated. We, we practiced just as hard, but we weren't cocky that we could go back and win it again. We got there and we won and that and that, we won them all. And nobody had done that in the 40 years before. And nobody's done it in the 40 some years since. Nobody knows what that's like except us. Dolphins 14 as they are. The Dolphins have won Super Bowl 7, have completed the greatest season in NFL history. In 1970, the age of Aquarius was all the rage, but while hippies, hip huggers, and flower power are relegated to history, 1970 was a year of profound and enduring change for the Miami Dolphins. For it was that year that Don Shula became head coach and the Dolphins joined the NFL. New sheriff in town. Every uh, minute of every day was planned. Everything was organized. And when we finally came to camp, I thought it was going to be pretty easy. Unbeknownst to us, when he started reading the schedule off that Sunday night on how we were going to practice, we were going to practice four times a day. Four day practices. Four practices a day. And still had a curfew. Why, why the hell we have a curfew now? And uh, we did tired, you know, and we didn't need a curfew. We, go, we were going right to bed. On a hot day in 1969 during training camp, our coach at the time, uh, George Wilson, would say, oh, what the hell, go jump in the pool. It was like boot camp for us. With Shula, we never had a drink of water in seven years. So we understood the distinction between the seven and seven guy and the guy who came in and made us start practicing four times a day. You know, when the season started and we won, and then we played again and won, and the players then started to buy into what I was selling. Hard work equals success. So uh, they joined in and from there on it was just Pretty much they accepted, you know, what we were what we were teaching and what we were coaching. And now it's serious. Now it's real. Now here's a guy who just lost in the Super Bowl two years before that, and he's anxious to find a way to get himself back on the right track too. And he transformed us through practice and through the psychology of how he made us look at the game that it wasn't about being great, it was about doing your job. So I was able to turn it around from 3-10-1 the year before to 10-4 and four my first year. 69 were doormats, 70 were in the playoffs, 71 were in the Super Bowl. We had never tasted the Super Bowl before. And I think there was a feeling of a lot of guys that we were happy to be there. But uh, my feeling were, to go out there and win the football game. And and we got beat pretty bad. So now I'm zero and two of the Super Bowls. And when you're zero and two, people say very unkind things about you. Like he can't win the big one. So until you win the big one, they're gonna keep saying those bad things. When we came back in 72, Don had us watch the game 
as soon as we got back. I mean, he was acting like he was real nice. Hey, hey, got to see you guys back. All right. Hey, Merrick. All right. Hey, Zonk. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to break up into groups now. You guys on offense. You guys on defense going there. We're going to be here. So we turn the projector on. And the first thing we do is we now, we're now getting criticized like the game was like two days ago. And we're getting criticized. Hey, look at this play right here. Look at it. It was like seven months ago. But we're getting it like it was two days ago. <laughs> and we get the same ream. And so then when, it, when it's over and he's done with his critique, he turns off the projector and he says, Now, you see how sick you feel now? You see how sick and sorry you feel now? Well, just think of how sick and sorry you're going to be if you don't go back and redeem yourselves for what you did last year. We were called bums all off season because we lost the Super Bowl. Said we don't want to ever have that feeling again by getting to the Super Bowl and not winning it. So we set out to a man that year that we would, in practice, provide the kind of product that we would set out on that field every Sunday. We knew that we were good enough to win games. We just had to win the big games. We, we felt we were going to go back because we were still a young football team at the time, too. And we had a lot of talent on that football team. I couldn't wait to have another opportunity. And I, and I was hoping that, you know, if and when we got the opportunity, that the outcome would be different. No one ever remembers who lost the Super Bowl the year before. They only remember the winner. Well, you know, a uh, year before, just going back a little, we had uh, played the, the longest game in history against the Kansas City Chiefs on Christmas Day. And uh, we closed out the old Chiefs Stadium by beating them on Christmas Day. And going into the next season, the other team that we were going to play first. And uh, we went up there and beat them in Kansas City in 125 degree weather. And uh, after that, we just kept winning and winning. And this will be a 40-yard attempt. The kick is good. He's in for the touchdown. Sets up, firing deep. Down there is Pulley. It is knocked away. At the five-yard line. Check it. It was Jim Kick who was down there. It was the deep man. It was knocked away by Bob Howard, the left cornerback. And shaken up on the play is Greasy. Yeah, it looks like his, his right ankle, Rick. Uh, it may be right here. He may have to go out of the ball game. Greasy goes down in the fifth game, and uh, he's out. Uh, we just found out that his right ankle was stepped on by a defensive lineman. So Earl now is with us on the sideline, and I told Earl, warm up, I'm going to put you in. So he goes like this. He moves his arm like I said, I'm warm. <laughs> I said, don't you want to throw a few passes? No, I'm okay. <laughs> Goes in the ball game. We knew we had to play harder for Earl than we had to play for Bob. And uh, we knew that we had to block a little long for Earl because he was a little up in age, more so than Bob was. Earl was playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers back in 1957 when I was 10. He would then be the guy come trotting in the game when I'm 25. There were some guys on the sideline saying, oh man, we're done, oh, we're, uh, we're finished, because they didn't believe in Earl. But we had to believe in him because he was our quarterback. And he came in the huddle and he said, he looked around, shots were like, oh, we're finished. <laughs> and he said, don't worry about it, we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. And we got it done. And in that particular game, uh, we were playing San Diego, um, and uh, I'd picked up a fumble and scored a touchdown with uh, on the, on the fumble, and that got us going. And and, um, and we didn't let the loss of Greasy, who was a great quarterback, uh, detour us from um, you know the goals that we had. We had a lot of confidence in Earl, and uh, we went out and won that game, and then we just kept winning. Earl Morrill, at 38 years old, came in. And we won the next 11 games with Earl as a quarterback. Each week it was, you know, grinding it out to, to make it happen. I had the luxury of having running backs that had different skills. Jim Kick was a guy that was a never going to fumble. He's going to catch the ball coming out of the backfield on third down. Great receiver. 
and down on the goal line, he would get into the end zone. You know, Zonka was the short yardage and goal line runner, and Mercury was just what the name says, Mercury. He'd get to the outside and great moves and great ability, speed, quickness. I call it situation substitution. I wanted kick in there in certain situations. I wanted Mercury in there in certain situations. I wanted Zonk in there all the time. <laughs> and, uh, and so that worked for me. From the defensive standpoint, if the other team doesn't score, you can't lose. And so that was you know, our philosophy. We had 165 points scored against us, is all, in 1972. It was a very unselfish group of players. It wasn't about me, it was about us. I didn't think about going undefeated. I just, uh, the thing that I thought about was winning, being there at the end. We were called a very unemotional team because there wasn't a lot of rah-rah in the locker room. Uh, we just went out there and, do, uh, and did our job. There wasn't any one person getting up like you see the day a guy get the guys in the huddle before a game started hollering and screaming and all of that. We didn't, we didn't have to do that. We knew we were good and all we had to do was go out there and perform. You know, the no-name defense got its name, no name, from Tom Landry. Tom Landry was coaching the Cowboys. They're getting ready to play the Dolphins and his press conference, he was asked about our defense and, uh, and Landry says, well, you know, I looked at their defensive backs and the, I know a couple of them, but the defensive line, there are a bunch of no-names. <laughs> and our defensive line, you know, read that and uh, they like to take that name and they call themselves the no-name defense. And uh, that, that, you know, hung on and became their trademark. The kind of individuals they were. They didn't want individual glory, they wanted team glory. A lot of people say being a player against teams with winning records. But for what, I mean, they're pros just like we were. I mean, they had to go out there and win to try to win also. We, we didn't pick our schedule. We just went out there and played the game, every game that we were going to win it. I don't know about any other team, but I know that the team I played on in 1972 was number one in offense, number one in defense, number one in special teams, fewest giveaways, most takeaways, least penalized, scored the most points, gave up the least, ran seven out of every 10 times, in a league that ran three out of every five times, broke the rushing record that year, falling 40 yards short of 3,000 yards rushing in a 14 game season. And when we had the game wrapped up, we never padded the score, not one time. In the uh, 13th game, we were in New York City, and the press is certainly bigger in New York City than any place else. And that's the first time anybody thought about being undefeated because they mentioned it. If you don't spend Sunday afternoon and Monday night watching professional football, you might not know there's a phenomenon in the National Football League this year. The Miami Dolphins have won 13 games and lost none, and if they win next week, they'll have the first undefeated season since the Chicago Bears had one in 1942. No one really cared we were undefeated uh, because our goal was to win the playoff games and then win the Super Bowl, and, and that was what was pounded into us. Uh, one game at a time, prepare, execute, win, and go to the next week. We really felt the pressure, not during the regular season going undefeated, but, but going into the playoffs. We knew that if we lost one playoff game, we'd be out. There's no worse feeling than losing a playoff game. If you're not going to be in the playoffs and you lose the last game, you know it's the last game. But if you lose a playoff game, your life stops suddenly, bam. Thinking back, I think it was a Pittsburgh game that uh, we were struggling and and uh, they had scored some touchdowns and had some pretty good talent on that team and a pretty good coach. Back then, the team with the best record didn't have the home field advantage. And we had to go into Pittsburgh to play the Pittsburgh Steelers, although we were undefeated at the time. And you go to Pittsburgh, you don't know what you're going to get weather-wise. Of course, you got the fans that you got to you know, go up against and uh, you know all of those things of being the visiting team and that made it that much more important for us to work hard and be prepared and uh, and it helped us get ready because we knew how hard it was going to be 
Greasy is now practicing going full speed for us, and Earl was struggling. So now I had to make a decision, you know, whether or not I should take a guy out that has done nothing but win for me, to put a guy in that had been injured, and if I didn't know that he was completely healthy or not. And uh, so at halftime, I made the change. It was just uh, unbelievable. Probably one of the toughest things I ever had to do because of my high regard for Earl and the human being that he was. He was the backup quarterback for Bob Greasy to start with. Greasy was ready to play in the next to the last game of the year against the Giants. He didn't play. Greasy was ready to play against the Colts in the last game of the year. He didn't play. Greasy was ready to play against Cleveland when they had us on the ropes for a little while and he didn't play. Only when Earl started to falter in the AFC Championship game in the first half did Shula say, it's time to put Bob back in now. Because Bob's ready to play. And Bob was ready to play. So you take the personality out of it, you take the ego out of it, and you got Earl doing a hell of a job filling in for Bob, but now it's time for Bob to come back. And the team never skipped a beat, and that's the moral of the story. I put Greasy in and he immediately took us down the field and led us to some touchdowns and we won the game. And now we're getting ready for the big game and I got to make a decision. Who do I start in a big game? Do I go to Earl who had done such a magnificent job or do I go to Greasy who looks like he's now approaching being back to what he was before the injury? Willard's is empty but a little shop across the street, the locker room is thronged. The present is there. The crowd is buying souvenirs, not of Lincoln's first inaugural and not of Nixon's second inaugural, which lies in the foggy future eight days from now. They are buying redskin souvenirs, passionately convinced that two days from now, there will be inaugurated a new and glorious era of world championship. We were underdogs. Being an underdog and undefeated us, you know, it's pretty hard to figure out. We felt the pressure going in, but we still felt that we could win. We felt the pressure, but we felt confident that we could win. The fact that we're underdogs uh, made me think that everybody else knew how tough it was going to be also. So that really helped us in our, in our preparation. The motivating factor that season was the fact we lost the Super Bowl the year before. And he never let us forget it. Coach Shula never let us forget that. So what was hanging over our head was not greatness, but the completion of the redemption and the atonement for what had occurred the year before. I gave it a lot of thought and uh, I decided that uh, I was gonna go to Bob because he had been our number one quarterback before the injury and he was gonna be our quarterback of the future. The Dolphins have won Super Bowl seven, have completed the greatest season in NFL history. And that is going to be the end of the ball game as the Dolphins have won it by a score of 14 to seven. The white handkerchiefs come out. Shula put it on the level of a sin when it occurred in Super Bowl six and called for redemption. And, and he made us with that psychological F in our pockets the whole year. So when the guy asked Larry Zonka after we win in Super Bowl seven, and he says, well, how do you guys feel great? Do you guys went undefeated? How does it feel? And Zaga says, hey, I'm just glad to get the old man off our backs. And, and, and that's what it was. After being zero and two at the Super Bowls, it just, it was so important, you know, for me and our team to win the game. And for me personally, to, uh, to get that monkey off 
my back and, uh, and just uh, not be the coach that couldn't win the big one. You were now the coach that won the big one. And that changed everything in my coaching career. Our 72 team was just uh, comprised of guys that um, took a lot of pride in their work, were very intelligent. I think the important thing is, is the job that the coaches did um, and the camaraderie that we had as, as players. Oh, it was a great honor for me to play a lot of those guys, uh, other Hall of Famers other than myself. Watching the great Paul Warfield when I was a younger guy and uh, then ended up playing with Larry Zonka and Mercury Morris, Jim Kick. Our offensive line, which we had a lot of pride, we felt we were the best offensive line out there. And so I still feel we were the best offensive line in history. Our team, we were so good at what we did because we practiced in a certain way that took ego out of it. They just believed in each other. You know, 48 years later, uh, we're still very close friends. We get together every three to five years. We formed a company to sell memorabilia um, that everybody is a member of. Um, and so I can tell you where everybody lives and what they're doing and how they're doing. And, um, you know, that very seldom happens. And, you know, we have reunions uh, every now and then, and, uh, and uh, just recently, here at the house, we had a reunion, and, and the players all came, and, uh, and they stood around to, telling a bunch of lies about me, things that I don't ever remember yelling or saying to them. But, you know, they had the mic, so what could I do? I had to listen to them. And when I got the mic, they all left. Each year you get older, you know, it becomes probably more important because no one, no one has done it since we did in 1972. And um, the interesting, other interesting fact is no one thought much about it until the Chicago Bears came into a Monday night football game in Miami in 1985. And they were undefeated. Uh, Coach Shula asked a lot of the players on the 72 team to come to the sideline. We beat Chicago that day. They uh, went on to win the Super Bowl and had one loss. It was against Miami. And that's the first time that we really thought much about being undefeated. We said, geez, you know, it's 13 years. And someone came up and said, well, it never had been done before. It's a great feeling to know that we're still respected for going undefeated. Nick Bonacani and I live, and Bob Greasy all live within in, uh, four doors of each other in Coral Gables. And uh, one year when uh, the last team lost, um, I grabbed a bottle of champagne and went down to Nick's house and we celebrated. And they were too cheap to invite us to the party. I think records are made to be broken. And one day uh, someone will go undefeated and, and uh, then they'll just tie a record. I don't see it happening, you know, right now. It, it's so hard to go undefeated. So the competition in the National Football League is what makes the league special, what it is, and the fans on, on every team, every city, just, they go to a game, you know, with the idea that their team can win, and they're gonna see a good game. And I think that's what Bert Bell wanted to happen in the National Football League. He wanted the fans to see and to think that they were gonna uh, be witnessing a very competitive game where both teams had talent and the game would go back and forth and there'd be a winner. But I don't think that he ever envisioned, you know, uh, winning them all, winning all of the games, the perfect season. I'm Coach Don Shula, and I approve this message.
shoes of a player stepping on the field without a thing to lose. The bus is closing up the view on ESPN, asking me that stupid question. Think they'll do it again? Once again, I'm home to school about the thought of defeat. I got no losses on the table, so you can't take the seat. My perfect history will tell you that the record's complete. Stand up, you bus is playing for taste and defeat. Every year they try to 